is to um, show you how complicated things can be done very easy and basically they mostly sound only complicated there are much more complicated things but but they are absolutely different things so it happens that a lot of people are afraid when building uh, uh, web applications microservices uh, uh, people are afraid of the term background task because it involves a lot of some some very complicated knowledge ancient knowledge about different frameworks tools and uh, in practice everything is much much more simpler it's just because in python world we used to stick with salary and uh, salary is a good thing uh, don't get me wrong it it is a perfect out of the box solution but for some simplistic tasks, salary may be very overcomplicated. So uh, there is a, the Python ecosystem is good in, in the sense that there is always a tool for everything. And there is always a tool that uh, can do whatever you're looking for in a much, much, much simpler way. For example, we have full featured web frameworks. We have micro frameworks. Uh, develop as you go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, today, uh, background tasks. In simple terms, what we will try to achieve is we will try to do some complicated things uh, that require a lot of time and resources without uh, producing a huge ton of downtime. So without bringing our uh, services down. And uh, uh, let's just try to uh, develop as we go in order to see the evolution of solutions. And uh, let's see what, what kind of solutions do we actually like, dislike, uh, uh, lean towards, and uh, don't want to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will share my screen. Uh, please notify. We see. Okay, so um, let's start with a simple web application. I picked a, a Flask micro framework. Uh, ideally, every uh, uh, WSGI compliant framework will do. Um, so it's just a concept and uh, that's the important part. Okay, so the application looks very simplistic. Basically what it uh, achieves, uh, I will probably share my whole screen because we will switch to terminal and to browser from time to time, just a second. Um, better. Okay, so uh, first things first, we pick micro, micro framework and write a very simplistic application. What this application does is this application has endpoint execute. And basically uh, what it, uh, uh, it reacts to, to triggering this endpoint and says something like done. For now we are doing nothing. We're, we're just exposing endpoint where we will um, create our heavy task. So let's go to, let's go to our execute. Boom. Oh, sorry, we must start our application. So uh, that's basically nothing. That's like uh, the ground zero from where we start. Uh, so um, let's start with a very, very uh, at first, it, it may be abstract, but uh, keep in mind that we are dealing with example and in the real world, we will deal with real tasks like encoding videos, sending emails, uh, delay. Uh, we are speaking about delays uh, that can take not like 60 seconds, but can take up to five seconds and be crucial for application uptime. So for now, we will create uh, some kind of heavy task. Let's call it very heavy task. And uh, basically we will 
do something very long and very complicated here. I don't want to use sleep because sleep basically waits. Let's just uh, uh, stress Python interpreter for a bit just to see that our CPU resources besides time are also uh, utilized. So what I will do is uh, I will just make a huge, huge, huge uh, uh, loop without actually doing something. But keep in mind that this loop will also um, overload interpreter because we are in the dynamic language and we don't have a very uh, smart optimizer that basically can understand that we have uh, empty loop and wipe it out. In Python, this is interpreted world. So interpreter thinks we are actually doing this with some, some sacred purpose. So ideally in C this won't work, but in Python we, we can uh, actually load uh, with such approach, but just for the sake of being polite to the uh, Python, we'll ask uh, uh, optimizer to not wipe out this logic. So basically it executes. Uh, so let's try to take uh, this very heavy task in our, uh, let's connect our heavy task to our endpoint and let's see what happens. So first of all, uh, I enabled auto reloader. So basically every time we update sources, uh, ideally uh, they must reload, but just in case I am double checking everything. Okay, so let's open our top page. Uh, uh, and basically, let's try to call our endpoint. Okay. Oh, we started. We started. Let me just reload because reload didn't work actually. Don't trust the auto reload. Okay. Maybe try more than million. Uh, I think million is enough because I tried, but just for the sake of, I will, for now I will put sleep just to test because I'm pretty sure million worked. Uh, so let's. Let's try. Let's try to check. Okay. Yeah, so sleep works, but ideally, ideally, million must work too. So we'll do like this. Boom. And that would be one second. And let's try 10 seconds. Okay. So we finally triggered uh, something more complicated than just request response. And that means that we have to wait. And <clears throat> That's basically the first things. Uh, the first the first thing that comes to mind. Like, why don't we just put a very long, uh, complicated task inside an endpoint? It may be. It may sound okay. It may be okay, but um, uh, keep in mind that uh, in real world we don't have time. Uh, is a very complicated thing in the sense that. First of all, we have a limited number of workers. And what that means is that um, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't process everybody at once. We are not concurrent with a blocking logic to, to the maximum extent possible. What that means is that if we have, for example, four workers and we will ask every worker to perform a complicated task that uh, gets executed for about 10 seconds, 
and that would be a blocking logic. We base, what that basically means is that we lose all workers for 10 seconds and nobody else will be able to uh, actually uh, um, execute any task during this window because we are basically working on something. Besides, there is also such thing as a timeouts. So requests are not endless. Web servers and clients are configured to listen uh, to logic for a specific limited period of time, be it 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Uh, ideally, you can't make timeouts more than five minutes. Uh, so uh, even if we will have, say, 1,000 workers and we will load only one worker with a task that gets executed for one hour, we can do it in foreground mode just because this task will be killed. It won't be uh, executed. You won't get a uh, response back. So um, what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, such approach doesn't work. Let me just, uh, um, just for example, take set timeout to five seconds. What that means is that we won't make it in time. Oh, it's pretty much obvious, but let's keep this timeout just for it to be our um, uh, limit that we will try to honor. Okay. So basically we see in the console that uh, um, process manager detected that worker did not respond during this time. For now it's 10 seconds. It, it will be 60 or something like that and uh, try to kill it. So we won't receive a proper response now. We won't receive it at all. So uh, what are options here? The first option that comes to mind is like we need to somehow in, in, in essence it's uh, it's a correct assumption but the implementation is not uh, obviously correct from from the first attempt so we need to somehow uh, execute uh, heavy task in parallel provided the fact that we don't need to provide results immediately so we can execute task in parallel and once the task will be executed, we will um, save something in the database, uh, execute some kind of notification, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's try to do it with our Python standard library. So what we will do is uh, we will import multiprocessing. We will import process. So simply speaking, we will use uh, our CPU uh, core to uh, execute this task in parallel without uh, consuming workers. And that would be a much better solution, but uh, definitely not ideal solution. So what we do now is that instead of doing this, we will create process Yeah, so I think it's F. So as I remember. So very heavy task. And we started. So let's try again. I don't trust out a reloader, sorry, so I will reload just in case. So, oh, yeah, it's it's not F, it's uh, just a second. Um, To not waste time, I do believe it's uh, 
target, sorry. Yep. So let's let's execute. Basically, what we do here is we uh, create a separate process. You know, in Python, we have a global interpreter log. Threads are not very parallel. Processes really parallel. So we, we, we can uh, do uh, multi-processing and basically execute this in, uh, very fast, which is okay. Let's try. So notice what happened. Um, so we uh, we started our task, but we received done immediately. Once again. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So basically, what does it mean is that uh, we are executing uh, things in parallel. This is not safe. Why? Because, for example, initialization systems like system D uses C groups, and uh, even if we will fork a process, whenever a uh, uh, master process goes down, child processes can also go down. But nevertheless, uh, this allows us to execute things in parallel. Uh, sorry, just a second. Maybe I misconfigured my GI while I, I was working. So what, what you see is that uh, execution took uh, uh, basically nothing. It's, uh, almost uh, um, returned almost instant. At the same time, we actually executing uh, our logic. Just one second. I want actually to go with uh, four because I li like the way four overloaded CPU, and that was uh, it was much easier to show that we actually executing something. So let me just, just one second. I think it will be much better if we will go to top and we'll uh, see things uh, with our own eyes. But for some reason now it doesn't work. It worked previously and right during the demo, it stopped working. Okay. Uh, don't know. Probably Python optimizer actually wiped out this. Okay. So, uh, just to recap, we we execute it in parallel, but it's very easy to overload our uh, um, logic. Why? Because uh, we rep we do not load worker. But every time somebody triggers worker, worker starts process. This process can fork twice, uh, triple times, whatever you want. It may execute something. But the problem is, is that every time we trigger worker, it is very easy for worker to start process. At the same time, uh, these processes, uh, they, uh, uh, they live inside the system. So the system, it's very easy to overload system because uh, now we have uh, such notion where it's very easy to execute worker. It's still not easy to execute task. Okay, so uh, this approach also does not work at least in terms of performance is it's a bad option. So uh, what other approach can we use? Um, we can use some uh, job system. For example, as I've said, we have salary. Salary seems good, but it's very uh, complicated. You need message broker. Salary is uh, made with uh, distributed nature in mind. That means that basically and ideally salary must be deployed uh, in, in, uh, um, 
in a network with a lot of nodes. Um, it doesn't scale well. It's overcomplicated if you want to just do background task on one single node. Basically, if you need an option to the, uh, to postpone task and execute it, it's it's a very very overcomplicated option for that. So let's try to use um, UVSGI uh, uh, UVSGI as people call it. I call UVSGI just. Uh, just for the sake of the, I don't know, I, 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 I like it to call it like this, so, but just keep in mind that it, people use, usually say USG. Uh, okay, so uh, what's, what's our options here? So um, let's try, let's try to take the approach with a background execution, but made one limitation, important limitation. That limitation would be, yes, we can quickly unload complicated and heavy tasks from the worker, but there is a limit to amount of tasks that can be executed at the same time. What that means is we have worker, we can execute worker 50 times, that potentially needs to start 50 uh, heavy processes running um, in the background. But we uh, basically do not allow to run unlimited number of heavy tasks. We just run, say, uh, one uh, background process at time. Uh, but at the same time, we promise that we will deliver, we will process all, 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 uh, all the tasks we have. So. For this, we need to use a system called uh, UVSG spooler. So let's try uh, to import it. So first of all, let's try to enable it in configuration. So uh, how does it work? So if I will, um, let's try start without any directories. I will explain what these directories are. So uh, we have a configuration without Spooler. Uh, Spooler is enabled with only one option. Uh, we can configure it to a very flexible uh, um, state, but for now, uh, the only option we need is Spooler. Um, spooler basically tells us uh, a place where we will pick our tasks from. Do not forget that if we will, if we start processes, we basically have we don't have any persistence. What that means is that if we are trying to start process and the process startup fails, we don't have uh, this process anymore. So the approach of limiting background task execution with uh, forking new processes does not work. We need some kind of registry where we store our tasks, a bucket with tasks where we can pick tasks so that we always see is there anything else we can do without losing any data. So um, um, UVS, UVSGI uh, allows to do it with uh, a concept of file system. It's very easy. You don't need message brokers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have a directory and every background task is represented as a single file, simple, small file. And if you execute this task, the file gets removed. If you create new task, the file gets created. If something got um, wrong, for example, service went down, uh, you can uh, easily, next time you start service, it will pick up from the place where it started. It won't uh, forget about the task because the task is a file. So when we provide such option, we basically tell Spooler that he needs to monitor directory tasks because from now on, we'll put uh, our uh, background jobs in this directory. So this directory appears. Uh, there is a possibility to provide multiple directories. For example, I can do like tasks two, tasks three. What it will, will do is that uh, it will create three directories 
and these three directories will be monitored by spoolers. Important things to understand. Spooler is not one process. So consider spooler to be um, a set of uh, um, an entity that has a responsibility over uh, some specific directory. So for example, uh, if I will, uh, there is an option spooler processes and here, uh, if I will provide spooler processes equals one, that uh, this won't create one spooler process. This will actually create uh, three spooler processes, each spooler process monitoring its own directory. So basically uh, you need to multiply uh, the amount of directories by times spooler processes. So for now we'll, we will have three spoolers. Let's check it. So we have created three spoolers. Basically, whenever anything comes in any of these directories, it will be uh, processed. Uh, okay, so we enabled spooler. So what do we do next? We have a function called very heavy task. So let's just let's just try and send it to spooler. It's very easy. So uh, if we will um, uh, install uh, USGI package, we will get an import called uh, USGI decorator. So I will type it correctly. I typed correctly. So. So we have basically a decorator called spool. And whenever we set something, we assign decorator to any function, that function is immediately postponed to background. But there is a few important things. First of all, decorator will return some arguments. So we need to be prepared for that. And let's just... Let's just take these arguments into account. For now, we don't need actually them, but let's just not break if the, if the decorator will send some arguments. And uh, another important thing is that Spooler, Spooler needs a specific response, specific return value. Why? Because uh, uh, based on this return value, Spooler can understand whether he needs to retry task, whether he needs to be executed uh, continuously, endlessly, or whether execution completed. So without receiving a pro proper return, next time Spooler will see the same file in the directory. It will treat it as a broken, unfinished task, a task from the previous time, and basically will try to execute it again. So in the very end, we need to return a specific return for that. And uh, it may be obvious, but ju just in case, I need to emphasize that this part must be bulletproof. So ideally, this part must be executed no matter uh, how reliable logic inside uh, is located. Usually, it's a good uh, approach to make it try accept finally, uh, finally close. Uh, yep. So uh, let's let's try. So uh, keep in mind. The only thing we do is that we actually just execute function. So okay. So request completed in uh, uh, real fast. That's for sure. But we still have logic execution running in the background. Um, let's wait for a bit. So the, the um, task was postponed uh, here. So what we now I'm waiting for is task successful task execution. But we have sleep and it will take 
probably. I don't like usually playing with slips, even for um, like training purposes. I don't know why this stopped working right about now. It's strange, actually. Maybe try to confuse optimizer this way. I actually really, really want you to see Oh. Vadim, uh, yeah. 10 million iterations works a half of one second. Yeah. So 100 million iterations mm, should okay. be okay. Yeah, pr probably. It's too much. Yeah, yeah. So... 100 million. It's milliard. Okay, let's try. Sorry, because I tried. Um, maybe I really forget the amount of zeros I put into it probably yeah you're absolutely cor correct sorry that that was uh, you're absolutely right so the optimizer do not wipe this uh, loop even if it's basically has no side effects and but now uh, why i wanted to actually not use sleep but use something else we actually see uh, the, the, the process is actually running and that's a very good thing. So now we, we can see what happens in the background. So we were executing, thanks by the way. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes when you demo, you forget about basic things. Yeah. So we were executing 19 seconds. Do not forget that we have our timeout on worker 10 seconds. So basically, uh, the fact that we were executing in the background help us to execute even if we don't have, we don't allow to do uh, uh, this task for that long in the worker. So uh, what can we tell now? Uh, we can tell that we solved the overload problem. Basically, it looks like we just executing things in, in a separate process, but we have only three spooler processes, three processes. That means that at the same time, only one task from one directory can be executed. Uh, we can make more processes if you wish. For example, let's disable uh, two spoolers for now that we don't need them and make two tasks instead of one, okay? so. Uh, what, what that will allow us is that we can basically spam uh, our request. Let's see the directory tasks. We will see a lot of tasks there, but uh, these tasks are executed uh, uh, only uh, in two spooler processes. So we see two U UVSGI processes. Each of them are overloaded. They are executing. Load average is not uh, critical because we restrained them. So uh, long story short, the tasks slide, uh, uh, silently disappear. That's because we, um, uh, we um, finish one task and start another. And basically, oh, sorry basically that that would be it so pretty much easy yep yeah? yeah but uh, the spooler is much more than just setting directory uh providing uh, tasks and uh, waiting for tasks to be executed with uh, uh with the queue like this uh let's uh, um, let's dive uh, a bit deeper into spooler well that's uh that looks like a good uh, start and basically sometimes it's all you need on the local machine it's all you need but we also have uh, a few interesting options and when it comes to tasks and when it comes to a limited number of workers uh, we uh, basically always think about priorities for example we can have 50 tasks but among these background tasks there is one task that needs to be executed right away. Very, very urgent task. 
So the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, I would say, an incorrect one. So the first thing that comes to mind is that we know how to create multiple spoolers, listening to multiple directories. And uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's just create directory low priority tasks and create directory high priority tasks. And uh, basically we solved uh, priorities with, with the basic knowledge we already obtained. But that solution is not optimal. I will explain why. First of all, uh, uh, imagine a real world scenario where you have uh, multiple spooler groups, for example, two. And you have a and you have two spoolers per di directory. So in total, you have four spooler processes. Each uh, each pair monitors one directory. Now uh, let's place 100 tasks in one directory and one task in another directory. What we will receive is the spoolers that have only one task they will quickly execute this task and will be idle from that time because uh, they are isolated in their own directory. So you will basically waste resources. Two spoolers execute task and then wait. Another pair of spoolers, the first one, actually tries to execute 100 uh, tasks and tasks are coming, 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 coming. So Isolation, I would say more of a security feature than a performance feature. There is a better approach. And for that approach, we need to uh, enable Spooler ordered because Spooler uses uh, tasks uh, in a persistent file system. Spooler all also relies, uh, can rely if we will tell him so. Uh, he can rely on an ordering of uh, names. What that means is that task uh, starting with uh, letter A will be executed first. And uh, tasks uh, started with letter Z will, will be executed last. Uh, so, so basically we use our file system ordering to achieve our prioritization. So, uh, how can we do it? First of all, we ask Spooler to actually pay attention to the order of the files. But uh, if you will notice here, uh, Spooler creates these low level tasks that have uh, a very tricky names and the logic that generates these names is a very low level. So uh, if you don't want to use hacking um, and better not to because UVSGI is a very complicated uh, tool uh, written mostly in C, uh, we, we, we will use another approach, very easy one. It's called subdirectories. We won't create anything. USGI will create subdirectories for us. And uh, basically files with a very obfuscated, complicated names that are located in directory one and two have also different priorities because uh, uh, based on the file system ordering logic, directory one comes before directory two. So let's enable it. So for this, we need uh, to use parameterized spooling. So the spooling logic will become more complicated. Uh, so we will take, we will get access to our decorator. Remember we had a decorator on our very heavy task and we will execute it. But now we will provide parameters. And that's where the important thing comes. Uh, a few notes, important notes come. So uh, you uh, probably everyone uh, is already using Python 3. So maybe it's a redundant notification, but uh, here we need to use byte strings because a spooler is a very low level mechanism that uses UVGI uh, protocol. So here I will use byte strings all over the place uh, for payload. So uh, the first option that we will familiarize ourselves with is priority. Priority. 
Another important part, besides byte strings, uh, everything that we pass to Spooler, aka to our function, because uh, in real world, our background functions will also receive parameters, arguments. Uh, we need to pass a string. Why? Because uh, as I've said previously, we use file system for persistent storage. And USGI do not like to rely on pickle much. Basically, we need to freeze uh, our arguments in order to revive them later. And very complicated objects are not very reliable in terms of saving state on a file system. So uh, USGI solves this very easy. It says just use strings, please use strings. If you want to uh, interpret the strings as uh, different uh, types, you can use it inside your spooled function. But if we are speaking about junction between spooler and, uh, and our worker logic, we need uh, to move uh, strings through this junction. So, so we set priority one and let's see what that will, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, we also here can specify uh, what kind of spooler we want to use. For now we have only one, oh no, no, we actually, I don't, we have two real spoolers. No, 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 sorry. We have one spooler group on directory tasks. So let's remove these directories to not uh, confuse us. And uh, basically we have only one spooler, so we can provide, or, or we can just, just emit spooler for, for this scenario. So let's try to execute it and see what we will have. So we postpone task to spooler. Let's, let's check our top. We actually are executing this heavy task. But notice that we already, our worker is already free to accept another connection. So we are completely con concurrent here. Okay, so uh, task uh, executed successfully. And basically what it was is that we created a file in directory tasks under directory one. And basically that, that file was the most prioritized job we had. So here we'll find directory one. It's not a necessity for us to create this directory, but just keep in mind that priority works uh, by providing uh, um, directory names that will uh, uh, that will take part in an ordering. And for now, priority is accepted only as uh, numbers. So it may look like we can provide here uh, letters, digits, uh, floats, but for now only, uh, only integers are, are accepted. So priority can be one, two, three, four, uh, whatever we put, it, the corresponding directory will be created. So this task is the most important task. And by the way, keep in mind that we have uh, we have uh, two spooler processes at this point. Yeah. So let's let's just try to create two prioritized tasks. Oh, yeah. And let's create two tasks with lower priorities. Let's let's assign them priority two and see what happens. So basically, okay. So execution started, we have a lot of CPU going on. And what we see here is
as we ex uh, anticipated uh, uh, at first uh, tasks from directory one were executed next will be tasks from directory two now uh, once again this uh, approach with uh, pri directory pri prioritization is better because we have maximum pro amount of schooler processes watching over all directories so we want to have a situation as i described when one spooler group will have a lot of tasks and the other spooler group will just sleep and do nothing okay so tasks are still executed being executed and let's move to another uh, interesting trick with spooler and uh, but by the way, uh, I think that trick uh, uh, is the kind of trick I, I, I need to demo in the first place, because previously I, I provided you a settings where we had multiple spoolers, but I did not describe how we send task to another spooler. So that's my bad, sorry. So yeah, so let's create spooler tasks too. Let's for now uh, make one spooler process per group. Okay. So execution finished. So we will receive two spooler groups, tasks and tasks two. We, uh, in order to send, if we, if we want to send tasks to specific spooler group, for example, we have some very secure uh, group uh, with uh, um, full security perimeter set up. I don't know, it may be some kind of C groups, uh, CH root, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can uh, specifically state that we, we want to this task to be executed only in, in one spooler. But uh, to specify what spooler it is, we need to provide a full pass to this director, not a relative one. So now when we will execute things, we will receive multiple tasks. I triggered, started multiple tasks, but all of them will be created only in uh, spooler group task two. Uh, examples why that may matter may be, for example, you have multiple disks. So you, you have some kind of like partitioning where you say the um, like very, very frequent tasks can go to SSD, less frequent tasks can go to um, magnetic drive, etc. etc. Uh, uh, once again, security. Um, or, or just some kind of uh, like visibility into what you have. Okay, so uh, so we know we now know how to scale spoolers to say how many processes pick up tasks. We know how to clarify how many spooler groups we have. We want uh, ideally we want one because if we we'll, uh, USGI spooler is made with a simplicity in mind and whenever you try to do some very complicated something very complicated in the end you will go outside of your node you will go inside the uh, cluster and you ideally need to switch at that point to salary but if you know that you need just a background task execution on this node forever stick with usg so uh, for now one spooler one process we know how to prioritize tasks so let's discuss uh, let's discuss another option spooler max tasks i will set it to one just to show uh, what it does and while um, we are executing yep Let's wait for all the tasks to be executed. We have one left. Yep. So as you know, uh, Python has an automatic memory management. 
and that would be a good thing. But as you know, processes usually like to ask for uh, memory a lot in uh, kernel, but uh, they don't like to release this memory often. What I mean is that uh, even if you don't have memory leaks in your code, and in Python, it's very hard to actually get a memory leak, provided you work with raw Python. Uh, you actually can end up with uh, um, a scenario where your process executed a lot of heavy tasks. It required a lot of memory and it uh, requested a lot of memory from the operating system. But uh, this memory is not released um, in a good fashion. The process still thinks that he may need this memory, so he sticks to that memory, don't want to to give it away. And over time, you can end up with processes that take too much memory without memory leaks. And for this, uh, a lot of process managers uh, introduce a very simple concept of recycling. If you were a good worker, if you were a good process, if you did not crash, you still need to go away and to be recreated and you after some time or some amount of requests. This helps to, to keep memory balloons, let's call it balloons at bay. So spooler max tasks is, uh, the option one is not a proper option for that. Usually it's 100 or 500. I just want to show you a spooler recycle. So so let's let's provide one. What that means is that we recreate spooler after every one task gets uh, when uh, every single task gets processed. So let's Oh, yes, something. So we have, yeah, we are sending to tasks two. We don't, we disable tasks two for now. So let's have tasks. Okay. So let's see in our logs. So we have background task execution. We see USGI consumes 100% of the core. Uh, so, So we see new message, maximum number of tasks reached, recycling. Uh, this is a good approach to do with workers, with processes. Uh, the value may must be much, much, much higher because every time you recycle, you actually lose time. There may be a queue and you're constantly trying to say, hey, one moment I will sleep, one moment, let's continue tomorrow. It's not a good option to do it as frequent, but for the purpose of the demo, yeah, one one was enough. So yeah, let's, let's take 500 for now. Okay, so that's this option. I, I, I hope it's clear. It's pretty much clear, like um, recycling to release memory uh, on a much frequent basis. Uh, so Spooler Harakiri is uh, an option. It's the same as Harakiri. It's, uh, for uh, web workers, for uh, um, it, it's basically tells how long Spooler can express numbers, like for example, thirty seconds or sixty seconds. Here we can we can say like you can execute for one hour, you can execute for thirty minutes because we are working in the background. But still, from time to time, this option may be required around our uh, worker amount is not limited. So uh, we can fill all workers with a very long running tasks. And these tasks may fail for some reason. We also need some kind of like timeout notion. To, so that would be a good, uh, I would say it's a good uh, way to do things. But of course, timeout must be much, much, much higher. So I would say like, uh, I will set five minutes, but definitely it's not the limit. So 
another uh, configuration i wouldn't call it an important one but still for some load scenarios it's an important one spooler frequency whenever we provide a directory for spooler we actually uh, rely on the fact that spooler monitors this directory and whenever something appears there spooler gets uh, uh, quickly gets to the execution but uh, the tricky thing is uh, spooler actually pulls this directory and uh, what polling means is that there are some specific periods of time when you look inside this directory and try to understand whether something in it for example if spooler will use mm, one minute polling intervals that means that we can throw a task in a spooler directory and there is a chance we will wait for like 59 seconds before this task actually gets uh, starts execution so of course in background it's not that important how quickly you execute a task it's more of an importance whether the task actually executed without blowing uh, resources or workers but still the lower the frequency the faster the tasks will pick up uh, the but you will of course you will overload your disk you are you are basically executing redundant io like every once in a while uh, so everybody can pick uh, his own like configuration i think 20 seconds is enough for SSDs to not bother I.O. much, to not steal a lot of I.O. from the database, for example, and yet still um, react to tasks uh, as they appear. But once again, it's a preference of choice. So the last uh, option, uh, it's actually, it's much, much, much more frequent option uh, is Spooler Python import. Uh, the idea is simple. Uh, in a very complicated web framework, say Django, we need actually a setup logic. So we can just import something and say, hey, it's just a Django import. From now on, we will act on behalf of Django. We will use its features. We actually need to execute Django setup. Uh, without it, all the all this Django magic will not work. Uh, that's why people usually like to use manage PyY shell instead of Python. And inside in Python shell, they import Django. It's a very complicated and long task and you need to perform actually this logic. So Spooler Python import is uh, um, let's just create like init logic basically spooler import is a directory not directory sorry it's a module that basically tells tells uh, spooler um, it's a pass to module that tells Spooler uh, that this module needs to be imported. Uh, this module will have some kind of initialization logic. And after this initialization logic, um, you can freely execute tasks. Uh, do not forget that when you look at this code, you think that application is in our scope. You think, hey, I have this variable. And by the way, I have, uh, I have this import. It's actually fake because, uh, because of this decorator, this logic gets executed inside a spooler in a separate process. So it looks like you see all, uh, all scope here and you can access all the global scope here, but it's a fake. You need to use this, uh, uh, import logic in order to obtain everything to see everything that your uh, primary worker will see yeah so notice we have init word init print that we had pasted inside init py 
So nobody actually executes init, but because we asked Spooler to import it whenever uh, Spooler brings uh, um, start, is starting up, we actually get this logic. No. So here we will have Django init, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Init. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, that would be it for the spooler, but there are still a lot of uh, interesting tricks we can uh, use. And by the way, keep attention that this, uh, in order to start everything, we need only one option, this one. But uh, because the, the uh, because even with a basic uh, background task execution that Spooler provides, we have, mm, even with such level of uh, functionality, we have a lot of flexibility. We are still not a salary. We are not a complicated uh, ecosystem that runs uh, pings, nodes, et cetera, et cetera. But still, we have a lot of things. Uh, we can start with one line. Okay. so. Um, Let's enable shared area. And before we enable it, uh, what I wanted to say is that looking at this logic, uh, basically what we now know how to do, we know how to send uh, tasks to background. We know how to scale spooler processes. I want one spooler process, 10, five. We know how to uh, prioritize tasks. We know how to separate uh, directories. Looks like, speaking of basics, we have everything we need. Well, but maybe, just maybe, there is one important thing we actually want, uh, and that, uh, I don't know, maybe somebody is asking now uh, uh, whether we actually can receive data back from the spooler. And uh, we actually can, there are a lot of, uh, approaches to that. Of course, we can use a database as uh, as some kind of uh, place where we can interact with the data. That's absolutely okay. But on a much, much, much lower level, speaking of the data that does not uh, have, speaking of the data that basically is very primitive in its nature, we actually can. We actually are missing interprocess communication in order to get the whole picture. In order to get the complete solution, we can just take and start uh, writing uh, logic from now on. Uh, why interprocess communication matters, and I think why it comes along with a spooler. Also, it's a separate subsystem. So uh, in practice, we had a project where we had a lot of uh, spooler. We, we had a correctly set spooler, but uh, once in a while we uh, hit uh, a problem where spooler actually executed multiple same tasks in a row. Uh, and in that specific scenario, it was definitely uh, not a desired effect. For example, you have, uh, you have a very prioritized task that needs to be executed every 10 seconds, for example. Yep. And besides that task, you have a lot of other tasks. Uh, that task uh, needs to be executed once in a while, every 10 seconds, but it doesn't uh, bear any uh, specific context with it. Uh, what I mean is that the third of execution of this task does not differ from the fourth execution of this task. The only important uh, of this task. The only important fact is that this task needs to keep on going. <clears throat> so under heavy load, under a lot of like different scenarios, we end up sometimes with a scenario where we have a lot of tasks. So we definitely have no time to sleep, no time to wait. But for some reason, for spooler process, execute four uh, tasks of the same nature that must be executed only once 
and that uh, and uh, that basically are uh, irrelevant when executed multiple times. Simply speaking, uh, we need uh, some concept of a singleton task. We need uh, some concept of a singleton task, uh, a task that gets executed only in one instance, and that's it. So for this, we need a separate subsystem, but I think it's a very important to use it here. For everything else, we can use database to intercommunicate. We can use database to, to provide progress. Not a big deal, but, but um, like ensuring the tasks are executed uh, um, in a single instance. It, uh, I think low level process communication is a good thing to not load database much. So let's do it. So first of all, we need to enable uh, shared area in our UVSGI. And basically what the number means is, means uh, it means the amount of memory pages we will allocate. Uh, in different operating systems, in different setups, uh, memory page can consume four kilobytes of data, uh, eight kilobytes of data, 16 kilobytes of data. Uh, so it, it depends. If you have a very complicated inter-process communication, you can assign a huge shared area pool, but for now we, we need only, only one. So our inter-process communication will be established between only one task, so not a big deal here. So let's check that shared area is actually enabled. Uh, UVGI will tell us uh, about this. Okay, just, just a second. I will try to find shared area. Shared area zero created. So we created one page of shared area. That would be our small, uh, sorry, that would be our small uh, bucket in memory where we, that we will use to, uh, um, to uh, exchange communication messages. Okay, so let's start. So basically we need two functions. Uh, shared area read and shared area write. Shared area write. Something is not right. will recall everything in the field. So what we will do now is that whenever our application start starts, by the way, it's, yeah, it needs EVJ initialization. So it must be called like this. So whenever our initialization starts, we will initialize shared area. So, uh, first uh, argument is ID of our uh, bucket of our segment. And uh, uh, shared area, right. Another uh, second argument is offset. Uh, because we have a low level, uh, low level shared area storage, uh, there is no, the, there, there are no rules for uh, every participant. We need to use offset in order to uh, introduce a convention like your part of memory is uh, these bytes and sides at this offset. My part of memory is at this offset, this uh, size. So let's write at offset zero in segment zero, let's write message idle, low level, so byte strings are uh, required here. Okay. 
uh, so when we start task execution inside spooler, we actually will write, we, we will overwrite this segment and we will write message busy, the same in length. So we have four bytes, four bytes. And here, instead of done, oh, no, no, it's better to introduce separate endpoint to not start new tasks. So we, let's, let's introduce status endpoint where we just read read the data so what we do here is that at segment zero at offset zero we read four bytes so uh, in our sample in our example we always use four bytes it will be either idle in byte string or busy okay so let's assign an endpoint for that okay Vadim, I'm so sorry, we have 15 minutes before the end. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I, I'm pretty much, I think uh, uh, it's a good time to start Q&A after uh, inter-process communication. So basically that would be it. So let's, let's just check that we uh, status. Let's just, just check that the endpoint works. So we received idle because we initialized uh, um, our shared area was idle. Let's start, let's actually execute tasks. Tasks. Okay. So tasks don't see tasks for now. Just a second. Let's Execute. Um. Just a second. We are almost done. Um. Or started. Uh, 12 minutes, correct? Yes. Okay, just a second. I missed something. So task was created.
Yeah, sorry. I most probably disabled ordered spooler and it uh, did not look in the correct directory. Sorry for that. Okay. Let's check that part actually. Yeah, it started. So notice when we uh, execute status endpoint, we now receive a busy. Because as you remember, if we execute something in the spooler, we uh, change idle to busy. I think the only thing left is that we set value to idle right before finishing the task. And we are done. And we will, while no one is watching, we will delete tasks like they have been executed before already. Um, so, yep, idle, busy, 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 busy. That's right. And idle. So you can use it to uh, communicate between processes, between worker and uh, wo between workers and spooler processes, uh, between spooler processes, between workers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think it's a it's a good idea to utilize this along with spooler. Keep keep in mind it's very low level, it's very fast, and sometimes you need to pass some simple value to other process without actually and you don't actually want to overload database so i think uh, the main we're basically uh, covered uh, like the main uh, handbook of uagi spooler so we have nine minutes left if you have any questions feel free to ask <laughs>